Today's lesson is going to be about threats and vulnerabilities. This is a pretty big deal in the security world and something that we're going to spend a little bit of time on. A whole bunch of different types of malware or malicious software that's out there. 69.99% is Trojan horses. The others make up the rest of the pie chart. So really the word malware is a catch-all phrase for just about everything in the virus world. Um, if you can't fight, figure out what it is, then uh, malware is the moniker for it. Viruses oftentimes get into uh, specific files inside the operating system. Those include the executables, uh, master boot records, as well as other things. And if they get inside, it's very, very difficult for them to be removed. They can also be delivered via the macro viruses in Microsoft Word applications and cross-site scripting via websites. Another cool thing that we've been seeing are encoded PDFs that using something like Metasploit can be um, deliver a payload and if somebody clicks on it, then a remote session gets uh, entered back from their machine to the attacker's machine. One of the nastiest worms that we've seen in the recent years is this conficker. Uh, worm is self-replicating and it attacks any security vulnerabilities on the target computers. It doesn't need a, a host, which is the distinction between it and a virus. So it just, all it needs is a, a bandwidth and some connections. It does not need a host. Here's a timeline of some of the different viruses and worms um, dating back from 2007 till 2011. You've probably seen a bunch of different things uh, out on the market whenever you're browsing. Things like adware where maybe you try to see the information that gets passed on via marketers. Uh, Google's on the side advertises specifically to emails that you've sent. Yahoo does it. Uh, Ask.com toolbar. Facebook does it. A whole bunch of adware. Uh, if this gets installed on your machine, oftentimes uh, there's a little program that's running in the background that is recording something and sending it out to a particular uh, marketer. So spyware is very similar, it, uh, except it, it is secretly installed. Um, things like key loggers and um, other things that may be hidden from you innocuously. And what they do is they collect these small pieces of information without your knowledge, and that's the distinction here, um, without your knowledge and then send it off to a particular uh, person that's interested in that information. Trojan horse is uh, something that's that's pretty interesting. Uh, if you go back and think about the uh, the old Troy, um, where the the horse, the wooden horse, was delivered, and essentially it masquerades an attack. You can try to uh, encode specific viruses to give them a different look and feel, and essentially it gets past any type of antivirus or malware detector. Uh, intrusion detection system with the intent that it's going to do some sort of harm after it, uh, it gets inside the system. Uh, one of the examples here is the beast down in the bottom right hand corner. Rootkits are very nasty. Um, there's been a few evidence of that with the Sony BMG case and the Greek wiretapping case back in 2005. You should be able to go out and do a little bit of research on your own on, on both of those. But essentially, if these get installed in the root level or at the kernel level of your system, um, these boogers are very, very difficult to get installed. Not even a complete machine wipe can get these um, removed from your machine. So um, keep that in mind. There are some detectors out there that, like this rootkit revealer, um, it can show the hidden files. Oftentimes these rootkits hide from any antivirus by just changing themselves slightly to circumvent any type of detection. If you think about the old movie back in the 80s of uh, Matthew Broderick with War Games, 
um, there was a machine in there that was called the Whopper. It always asked, uh, can we play a game? And the game that it wanted to play was um, Global Thermal Nuclear War, or maybe just a nice game of chess. Well, the maker of that machine actually had this thing that we call a backdoor, which is what most developers do in order to try to do some sort of administration and remain undetected. Well, you know, the same sense in the hacking world. The hackers will try to uh, get you to install something on your machine so they can get a, uh, a covert way to access your machine and remain undetected. Things like logic bombs oftentimes get put into uh, applications and uh, you know it's very interesting if you've seen the movie Office Space over here on the right there's an example of that in there where they just do a uh, simple type of attack and the attack will over time try to accumulate a large amount of money. Um, in this particular case some sort of programmer could create a program that always makes sure that his name appears on the payroll so if he gets fired he still will get a paycheck. Botnets is the next topic we'll talk about and specifically for any type of security exam that you'll take you'll need to know this right here. It has a master-slave architecture and these botnets typically are made up of what's called the zombies. The zombies are uh, machines that have an agent that typically will run on them and the agent could be commanded at will by the master to do whatever it wants. In most cases they are used to do distributed denial of service attacks and that's the case with this particular diagram. Man in the middle attack um, typically happens whenever somebody is able to intercept the data and just um, maybe in a passive way um, listen or maybe intercept the data and then alter it. And if you were to use something like a, a proxy or uh, maybe Burp Suite, if uh, you're looking for a tool out there, Burp Suite is a good example of a man in the middle type of attack where if you're able to be in line between somebody and the internet, you can see the traffic, manipulate the traffic, and give a new response back to them um, based off of whatever information you have that was, that was submitted. Talked a little bit about these before, the distributed denial of service attacks and the denial of service attacks. Um, one of the examples that I always give in class is the WikiLeaks website uh, being hacked or uh, at least being overwhelmed when um, Julian Assange wanted to put the information, um, leak the information about the U.S. government out there. Um, you know, oftentimes the, the, the denial of service attacks come whenever somebody wants to try to just overwhelm a system. And uh, you can do that by having the botnet that we talked about a few slides ago and those zombies that are controlled uh, with a little agent that runs on them. Replay attack is, is pretty interesting. Um, there's a few different types of tools that are out there right now. One that I can think of off the top of my head is Scappy that can replay or craft packets and another is TCP replay, which if you were to go in and capture Wireshark PCAP data, you could just go through and actually replay that Wireshark uh, PCAP data. So what does that have in it? Well, I mean, if you're able to capture the network traffic, you can get usernames, passwords, um, and in this particular case, if there is no temporal or time-based um, in the authentication components of those particular websites, if somebody was to capture that packet data and then replay it, um, there's a good chance that if there was no session key or time-based um, available, then they would be able to just replay the message and be able to get into your um, secure web page. Smurf attack is kind of interesting. Um, essentially, somebody uh, spoofs a, an IP address and then sends out an all points bulletin to an ICMP broadcast address, which is uh, you know the, the dot .255 node on the network. Um, since it's being spoofed, um, the victim is essentially overwhelmed by 
everyone replying back to it. So the attacker, again, spoofs the victim's IP address, sends out a broadcast address to everybody in their grandma on the network, and then the victim is overwhelmed because um, all those machines reply back to that particular victim. So a lot of different key terms to memorize whenever we go through and do this. Uh, you need to be able to, to memorize these. Spoofing, spam, spam, vishing, spear phishing, farming. I would also say um, that you need to know whaling as well as uh, the rest of these. And you know, even a simple note card would be good for uh, memorizing these. A few different types of attacks that are typically shown on the exams, things like privilege escalation, uh, malicious insider threat, DNS poisoning, ARP poisoning, transitive access, and client-side attacks. These are all things that you need to be aware of when taking any of these certification exams. Of course, the, the phishing is something that's oftentimes shown in the media. Um, where you can try to send a, an email that looks and smells and feels like it's a, a trusted person like your bank, let's say. Um, and they're crafted rather cleverly. And typically they have the, um, the actual logo of the company that is going to be uh, tried to be spoofed. In this particular case, to try to get somebody to click on a link to go out to a malicious website. A Christmas attack is um, typically whenever you have the sin, fin, urgent, and push all set to a one. And this is something you need to know for the exam. So um, oftentimes in the marketplace you hear the packet was lit up like a Christmas tree. It means that all the different particular uh, Boolean values that could be set on that packet were set. You know, one of uh, my favorite movies that I like to watch is this uh, Fletch over on the right-hand side. Um, he's very creative, Chevy Chase, uh, with with his types of impersonations. Um, and, you know, sometimes in the network security world, we'll do that to try to get people to, to give us their usernames and passwords over the phones. Uh, a bunch of different types of social engineering are shown on the left-hand side. So shoulder surfing, dumpster diving, tailgating, impersonation, hoaxes. You need to know all of these for the exam that you're about to take. The wireless access attacks are uh, very interesting. Um, a bunch of different things are shown up here on the, the left-hand side. Um, as far as rogue access points, uh, you'll see a question or two on your exam about these where if somebody can stand up a, an access point and maybe leave it open. And if they do, then you connect to that particular access point. Um, they can see all of your traffic going through it. So if you were to log on to Facebook or your, your bank account, um, chances are really good that they would be able to see your, your session information as it's going back and forth. Uh, war driving is, is something that's very interesting, and uh, if you have a chance, you may want to go out to wiggle.net, W-I-G-L-E.net, and just check out all the different um, wireless access points that are shown out in the world right now. Wiggle.net really displays geographically a um, very good way to, to show that. So that's it for now. If you uh, have any questions, contact me at ben.c.mcgee at gmail.com. Thank you.